Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elio Mujeto and I'm delighted to welcome you all to 2013 uh, winter quarter and uh, to our seminar series in public health. We have quite a, uh, an exciting uh, set of seminars for this quarter and we can't be prouder for launching the series this quarter with our speaker for today. I know some of the uh, students are enrolled uh, in the seminar course. Uh, you pay closer attention than the rest of us because you have to <laughs> find articles that are related to the topic, review it, and review the presentation that you hear. And you submit those to the Dropbox. Uh, but this is uh, a blessing for, for the rest of us who have the pleasure of just learning from uh, distinguished speakers uh, such as Dr. Brad Polk. And um, he's a professor and the founding chairman of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the School of Medicine at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio. He also holds adjunct professorships at the University of Texas School of Public Health in the College of Business at the University of Texas at San Antonio and in the Department of Statistics at Texas A&M University. In 2001, he started the Center for Epidemiology and Biostatistics and in that same year, that uh, center evolved into the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics uh, in 2006. Uh, right now, they have 33 full-time faculty members and 60 staff members, so he gets very busy with uh, running <laughs> such a large department. But that's not all he does. He's also uh, the director of two units of their NIH-funded Clinical and Translational Science Award. Uh, this is a major endeavor, and he told me this morning that they just submitted their renewal or that it's due today, so he's been very busy in the last two weeks, I'm sure. Uh, the CTSAs are uh, one of the legacies of uh, the former NIH director, Zaruni, and part of the idea is to create a forum for interdisciplinary research, uh, now better known as translational uh, research, and uh, to encourage more clinical uh, outcomes as benefits from basic research. So he directs the Biostatistics Epidemiology and Research Design, uh, the BIRD unit, which uh, Professor uh, Dr. Bob Newcomb does for us here at UC Irvine's ICTS. And thanks to Bob is how we got to know that Brad is in town and could do this presentation today. Uh, he also directs the Biostatistics and Informatics uh, <coughs> shared resource for uh, the National Cancer uh, Center there. Uh, this is all um, just remarkable in terms of how one pulls this together, but he's also directing the National CTSA Bird Unit. So this is a key functions committee of all CTSAs at the national level. Um, he's not new to Irvine, although he uh, it was difficult to recognize you see your point after coming back. He got his undergraduate degree in biological sciences here. And so some of you who are in public health undergraduate or biological sciences, uh, you're looking at a distinguished career path that could be yours. Uh, and then he went to UCLA to get uh, MPH and PhD in epidemiology. Uh, today, he's going to talk to us about primary liver cancer in San Antonio, from causes to interventions. Please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Paul Octavio. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> That's a, that's a really nice introduction. And I, I have to say, I, I give a uh, number of talks around the world in different places, uh, some very highfalutin places. But to come back to my alma mater, this is <laughs> quite a treat for me. Um, I, I left here in, uh, officially in 79, and um, I don't recognize the place. There was Campus Park and a circle of buildings around it, and that was it. So this, is, this was pasture land, I was told. But anyway, uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, let me see if I can figure out, yeah, I've got the, 
Okay, there we go. So actually, I'm going to talk today about liver cancer, uh, primary liver cancer, and um, in, in particular, uh, how this has sort of affected our local population in San Antonio. <clears throat> San Antonio, by the way, is the seventh largest city in the United States. We took over uh, from Dallas and San Diego a couple years ago, and we're growing very rapidly. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in LA, and I live in the new Los Angeles. San Antonio is the new LA. It's going to be megapolis in probably about 20 or 30 years, but uh, right now it's a very nice, it's like LA was back in the 1960s, a very nice place to live. Um, I want to talk about, uh, in particular, hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the most common cancer that occurs in adults. Um, it's also one of the most common cancers that occur worldwide. In fact, in some countries, it is the number one or number two most common malignancy. In the United States, it's much, much rarer, but it is a very, very big one in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, parts of Asia, as well as in the Amazon basin. I, I also apologize for my voice. It sounds a little raspy. I was at a wedding two nights ago, and there was a loud DJ there, and I'm trying to talk to all my cousins and friends, and I just was screaming to talk to the person next to me. So I don't feel bad, but my voice sounds a little bit weird, but you'll have to forgive me. <clears throat> um, I also wanted to kind of point out that that the liver cancer rates, and hepatocellular carcinoma in particular, which is the common adult one, it's not staying constant in terms of the incidence. The incidence rate is steadily increasing in the United States. Um, and, and, and basically, not only is the incidence rate increasing, uh, the mortality rate increases because we've got increasing incidence rate. Treatment is, is actually available for some of these patients, but the treatment doesn't work really well. And so you see that the, uh, while there's been improvements in survival rates, there's still a high mortality rate from liver cancer. And uh, this was a paper that was published by uh, one of the authors of the CDC that basically said that the trends may be attributable to increases in the seroprevalence rate of hepatitis B and C infection. And that's true. That may be accounting for, for a good part of the increase in the United States. Now, in Texas in particular, we, we have, uh, we're different. Texas is different. I never thought I'd be a Texan, but I was a Californian, native Californian. And, Texas uh, considers themselves uh, the end of the world. Uh, we even, you know, as a Republic of Texas, we were an independent country at, at one point uh, in, our, in our history. And uh, of course, uh, there's no telling what happens with cancer incidence rates. They vary from place to place. But this is what the, the state looks like here. Um, you think California is big? Texas is bigger. To drive from one end to the other, that's a full day. That's, I don't know how many miles across, but 1,200 miles or something like that to go across, maybe 1,100 miles to go across Texas. Um, so we're very big. We're spread out geographically. We have a combination of urban, suburban, and rural areas, large population, and we have a younger demographic than the rest of the United States. There's a, a, there's a higher proportion of younger people in Texas, and the composition of Texas is very diverse in terms of ethnicity and racial um, composition. Uh, California is also. Uh, Texas has a lot of the same characteristics. Very large uh, Hispanic component in, in, in Texas, as you had in California here as well. So um, one, of, uh, one of my colleagues actually went ahead and looked at the cancer incidence rates. And what you see here is you see all races combined on the left side, Hispanics, and then non-Hispanics on the right side. And the colors here represent different, different areas. So the national cancer rates for, for liver cancer are shown in yellow. The, the magenta color in the middle are the rates in all of Texas combined. And then the, the lavender color you see there, those are the rates of cancer in South Texas. And you can see that we have a pretty big differential there in terms of incidence rate uh, compared to the national or even the rest of Texas. Uh, and actually, in fact, about two and a half times higher cancer rates in South Texas compared to the, the US average rate. So that's, that's a big deal. You don't see this kind of variation in cancer incidence in most of the common cancers. This is a graph uh, figure that's, and I'm sorry, I don't know if there's a pointer here or not, probably not, and it's not a touch sensitive screen, but I apologize. But the top figures that you see here, the top lines represent the Latino population. And within those, the top three lines there, you'll see the bottom one is basically the cancer incidence rate in the US, uh, that's the SEER program that the NCI keeps, which is a representative of the US, of the US population. Moving up, you'll see the rates for Texas Latinos, and then at the very top, you'll see the South Texas Latino. And this is, these are very significant differences. And the bottom figures represent the non-Hispanic uh, population, the non-Hispanic whites. 
And you'll see that they're kind of, while there's some variation there, they're kind of clumped together. So there's not much geographic variation, but certainly a huge difference in incidence rates uh, within the South Texas population. <clears throat> this is showing you the incidence rates over age. And you'll see, again, there's a divergence here between Hispanics, which are shown in, in green, and uh, non-Hispanics shown in orange. So you'll see that throughout lifespan here, there's a divergence that really occurs in the 40s and 50s, and it really keeps on going in terms of the incidence rates. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about our local population. So San Antonio is located in Bejar County. We call it Bear County. And um, uh, this is what the county looks like there. San Antonio, as I said, is the seventh biggest city in the country. It's actually spread out a lot like Southern California. The cities are not, not very vertical like you have in New York or Chicago, but they're actually kind of spread out. Um, what happened was we have actually a huge presence of the military in San Antonio. In fact, the Army now has got their medical headquarters in San Antonio at Brook Army Medical Center. The Air Force has, has had Wilford Hall as their primary medical facility for the country for many years in San Antonio. And they've combined both of those facilities now into the South Texas San, the San Antonio uh, Military Medical Complex. It's the largest concentration of military medicine in the world. And uh, they're building buildings like nobody's business. They're investing two or three billion dollars in building up military medicine at our place. Well, there's always changes in terms of the bases. And in 2001, the Kelly Air Force Base was actually closed. And part of it was turned over to the city of San Antonio. And this is part of the Base Realignment Closure Act uh, that kind of dictated that. And in fact, the, air, the airfield they have there, the, the airstrip, <laughs> the landing strip, is 11,500 11, feet long. It's one of the longest runways in the world. And in fact, it's a backup, it was a backup site for the space shuttle. If there was an emergency, they could land the shuttle at that. It's, 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 I think it's 300 feet wide and close to 12,000 feet long, which is a huge airfield. But along with that, they actually kind of re-amalgamated. So the airfield was turned over to the Air Force at Lackland Air Force Base, but then the rest of the property became Port San Antonio, which is a uh, aerospace complex they have a hangar there to re repair airplanes. You can see down below here. They can actually get five 747s side by side in this one hangar for doing repair work. And the Air Force used it to repair the large cargo jets. And then they turned it over to the city. And Boeing Aircraft actually has their repair facility there. They've taken that thing over. Of course, they were doing the repair work for the Air Force before. But they actually do civilian aircraft repair there. And I think they still do mil some military repair. Now, with that said, when they turned over the, the base to the city, they actually had to do a number of environmental impact uh, reports because the federal government can't just give away land. They had to make sure that the land they were giving away was going to be OK. They were required to do these Air Force uh, uh, impact studies there. And uh, this is from the Music Man. And there's a little thing of trouble in River City. It says, trouble in River Walk City. So San Antonio has the River Walk. Anybody been to San Antonio before? OK. So the River Walk is this great area downtown where they have all the hotels and restaurants. And it's kind of a fun thing. And they've actually copied this design in a couple other cities around the world. Well, so we had trouble in River City. When the Air Force was kind of turning this thing over to the city, there were a lot of people in the neighborhood there near Kelly that were complaining about lots of cancer, and in fact, liver cancer in particular. And in fact, uh, this is a, uh, some pictures taken in, 19, in 2006 showing people that were protesting that you can see, Kelly Air Force Base makes me sick. We were out, you know, there was a, a toxic um, waste dump there they're talking about. And it turned out that what the Air Force did when they were doing all the repair stuff, they used to use industrial solvents. And you know how they handled the solvents? They, you know, a lot of the solvents that were working on with mechanical stuff just were dumped on the ground. It leached into the, into the uh, groundwater supply there. And there was actually cases where they found people that were dumping toxic chemicals, just dumping them into the, there was a little canal runoff there. So there was a lot of stuff that was being thrown around there. It, it wasn't declared a Superfund site, but people were very upset about this. And it forced the, the, uh, the city government, the county government, to actually do something about it. So basically, in 2006, the, the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District, which is our city slash county health department, sent out a request for proposals entitled Liver Cancer Among Residents uh, Living Near Their Former Kelly Air Force Base. They wanted to collect information about what was going on. And in 2007, the Metro Health, as we call it, went ahead and created a contract for a Maryland company to come in there and do a spatial analysis of the 14 zip codes 
that were closest to Kelly Air Force Base to see what was happening. In that report that was done in that analysis, they found no, no evidence of clustering. There was no evidence of clustering in the county there, but there was still alarm over the relatively large number of liver cancer cases that they were seeing that came from the state cancer, the Texas Cancer Registry. So that was kind of what happened. This report got issued. Uh, the report was sort of inconclusive and dodgy because the data that was in the report, the results of the report, didn't support any argument one way or the other about whether there was or was not a cluster there. There was not sufficient evidence to imply that there was a cluster. And so the county health director was a little bit concerned about this. And in particular, when they got back to the community, the community thought they were doing a whitewash, trying to bury this under the carpet and not do anything about it. And so the county health director put together a blue ribbon panel that was supposed to, we were, I was on it, we were tasked with trying to do an analysis of what was done in that previous spatial cluster uh, assessment. And in fact, what we found was uh, the other analysis was really flawed. They used zip code as a unit of aggregation. A lot of you probably haven't done ecologic analyses, but these are where you look at aggregate areas of a population and you assign exposure to an aggregate. So you can measure air pollution this way, for example, and assume that the air pollution levels are the same for a zip code or some other geographic unit. Then you look at things like cancer rates where you account for every cancer case and you try to put those together to see whether or not the cases that you're seeing are correlated or associated with the exposure there. The problem is it's not done at the individual level, it's done at a group level like that. The problem with, the, with this other report was that the group that they used was a zip code, and in San Antonio, some of the zip codes had populations of 50 to 100,000 people, which is huge. It's not a very small unit of aggregation. So it's hard to make an assessment about whether a high or low level of exposure in a zip code is actually going to be causal or not, because <coughs> it's just too crude. So we recommended that the analysis kind of be ignored, but that really to do it the right way, you needed to analyze it by something called census tracts. And census tracts are developed by the Census Bureau. They represent populations of about 5,000 people. So whereas there may have been 50 zip codes in, in our county, there are something like 250 census tracts to actually look at more, more carefully. And of course, you can get cancer registry data that ties people's cases directly to their residential address. And you can look at other things like environmental contamination at a much finer level of resolution. So we actually uh, went ahead and did this assessment and told the county health director you needed to do the analysis a different way. I thought that was the end of the story. Six months later, he calls me up and says, would you like to do the study that you guys proposed? And I said, no, I'm too busy. But I have a faculty person who might be interested in doing this. She did a lot of spatial analysis for her dissertation. So basically, I got my junior faculty person to do the contract, got it started, and a month into the contract, my faculty person came in and said, I'm moving back to Korea. I said, when? She said, in two weeks. I got two weeks notice for a faculty person. So that's not good. If you guys ever get a faculty job, give your boss more than two weeks notice when you're going to leave. But anyway, uh, and I asked my colleagues if they could do the, the analysis, and they were all busy. So guess who did it? I ended up having to do it myself. And uh, lo and behold, when I did that, um, in the process of, of getting the data together, halfway through the project, the Air Force, which you would think would be not interested in helping out, right, because this might show that the Air Force was doing some bad things. Well, the Air Force people came to our meetings at the, at the uh, county health department, and they said, hey, we've got some interesting data we can send you. We've got these plume maps of environmental contamination near the Kelly Air Force area. So let me, let, let's go ahead, I'll, they gave, so they gave us these maps, I'll show those in a little bit, and we were able to look at the exposure levels in groundwater, which is kind of an indirect way of looking at things, vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the cancer incidence rates in those areas. So we did that analysis, we delivered the final report to uh, Metro Health uh, in 2011, and uh, let me just tell you what the contract called for. So they wanted us to look at the secular cancer incidence patterns uh, over the period 1995 to 2006. That's actually when Texas had cancer registry data. Texas was the second to the last state to actually have a statewide cancer registry. And the first set of data that were available were 1996. So we looked at that period of time. We identified areas of high cancer uh, occurrence. And then we actually did a formal geographic information system cluster analysis where we mapped the stuff out and looked to see whether there were clusters that were uh, over and above what you'd expect from kind of random distribution of cases. And just to talk about the methods a little bit here, so basically we calculated out standardized cancer incidence rates. We did direct standardization, and the rates were adjusted for age at diagnosis, race, 
and then sex. Uh, in addition to that, we did some, an alternate set of analyses where we adjusted for age, ethnicity, and sex. Okay? Uh, we then got the cancer registry data for those years, and we had every single case mapped out. We knew their residential address, so we were able to locate them in all the census tracts. We computed the cancer incidence rates for each of the census tracts for these three different time periods you see listed out here. They're four-year clumps of, uh, of data. <clears throat> we looked at spatial clustering using the STAT, the SAT scan software, which is actually developed uh, sort of independently. Uh, the, N the National Cancer Institute actually put money up for the development of STAT scan, and it's, uh, it's kind of used very commonly for doing cluster analysis. Uh, for cancer types of occurrence. We also did some other things with ArcGIS. There's some other me measures we looked at for um, clustering, but and they actually kind of correlated, and they, they were similar results. So we, I'm just going to present the StatScan results today. We also did some local uh, rate comparisons showing adjacency effects and so on, first and second order adjacency effects. I'm not going to present that today for, for time reasons, but let me show you some of the results here. So in the spatial cluster analysis, these are the maps here, and I'm, again, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but if you look at it, there is a mouse. Okay, the mouse. Okay, great. I'll use the mouse here. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. So the top panel here, actually, yeah, it's not. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. The top, the top row here represent the three time periods for the total cancer. So we looked at all cancers combined to see whether the cancer rates overall were changed and whether there was some clustering occurring. And you can see while there are clusters that were identified in each of these three time periods, they really didn't overlap each other. They were kind of not consistent for total cancers combined. The bottom panel of figures represent the liver cancers, the primary liver cancers alone. And what you'll see here, there was a cluster that clearly was, was kind of replicable across the three time periods here in the southwest part of the city, you know, kind of actually right near Kelly Air Force Base, surprisingly. And we, we saw this again for the, the period 1995 to 98 in the left-hand side over here, going over here to 2003 to 2006. And that was the most current data we had available at the time of the analysis. So that looked kind of interesting to us. Total cancers did not cluster consistently, but the liver cancers did cluster consistently across the three time periods in the area west of downtown. And there was maybe a little bit of a southern and western shift of that epicenter of each cluster, but not a really major shift at all. This is, like, again, the county map. So we're talking about the area marked with the A here. And you can see it's actually pretty close to downtown. Sorry, and that's where the cluster was right here in Lackland Air Force Base, around Lackland. That's, Lackland is basically where Kelly is located. Okay, so then I told you that we were able to get a hold of the plume maps halfway through our analysis, which was kind of interesting. And the Air Force gave it to us, the folks that did the pollution in the first place. So we went ahead and we compared the incidence rates in the census tracts that overlapped the plume compared to those that were not in the plume. And we looked at the two assessments that were done. They used a different uh, assessment for these two different time periods, but the first one looked at total volatile compounds, which is a kind of a collection of chlorinated hydrocarbons. And the second assessment they did in 2005 was looking at TCE in particular. And these are, that's a sentinel measure for uh, total volatile compounds. So you're looking at kind of similar types of pollution. This is the first plume map from 99 to 2000 that was done. And you can see the areas of density. And in fact, this gray stippled area, that's the Air Force Base. You, you notice the purple here? That's the, that's the airfield. That's the landing strip. And you'll see that the area of contamination appeared kind of adjacent to the base here for this assessment done in 2000. Uh, and then in 2005, when they looked at the TCE groundwater sampling, you'll see there was a little bit of a shift. Here's the airfield again. And you'll see here the pollution's kind of moved out a little bit to the, uh, to the right, a little bit to the east. Now, what we did then is looked at the census tracks for those areas that overlap the plume, and they're showed in the, in the uh, dashed uh, areas here. And the ones that are undashed, these are census tracts that are outside the plume. And what we did was we compared the standardized rates of liver cancer incidence and total cancer incidence for those two different areas, so inside the plume and outside the plume. And when we did that, we did this actually for the two different time periods of of uh, cancer incidents that we were reporting out. So you see a set here from 99 to 2002 and then 2003 to 2006. What you'll see though, as you move along here, the area in the plume here had a median liver cancer incidence rate of 12.8 per 100,000 per year. And you'll see that uh, for the not in the plume area, it was 4.6. 
And again, what that corresponds to, these are median incidence rates, it corresponds to an almost threefold higher median incidence rate adjusted for age, sex, and race for the areas in the plume versus out of the plume. And if you look at the control situation where we're looking at the total cancers combined, you'll see that these are almost on parity, almost of a ratio of about one. Okay, the same thing was true if you look down here for the more uh, recent cohort, the middle cohort, again about a 2.6 fold higher median incidence rate versus again on par about 0.9, almost one. So this is showing you again that the incidence rates appear to be higher in the areas where the contamination uh, seemed to be present. And this is looking at the second set of analyses that were done with TCE in 2005. Here's the plume area, the areas that overlap the plume versus not. And you see the same kind of numbers here, a little bit uh, diminished effect, but a 2.6 fold uh, higher median incidence rate. And again, almost par here, it's 0.8. But uh, certainly you'll see that's not sort of what you'd expect to see. <clears throat> so the other thing that we sat around when we looked at these data for the, for the first couple times, we said, well, what else might be going on here? And of course, most of you probably know that, that hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, the number one risk factor for that is hepatitis B or hepatitis C infections. Okay, that's, that's really the major cause of HCC, at least in the United States. So um, it turned out that like a, a number of other health departments, they were doing some surveillance of hepatitis in, in our county. And uh, although it turned out it wasn't very good data, but we basically got a hold of the about six years worth of surveillance data for hepatitis B and C infections. And we mapped out where those occurred. And those occurred in the area that you see that's kind of an orange here. That's really the epicenter of where our hepatitis seroprevalence was. And you'll see <clears throat> this is the area near Kelly over here where the plume was. No overlap between those two areas. Now this is not great data because we had, the, the county didn't think about keeping track of hepatitis assays per individual person, but rather each assay was a different assay. So if somebody got tested two or three times, we have two or three records in the data set, and that's not very good. It was all maintained in Excel. It was really kind of messy, you know, and it does go to show you that data quality can have a big impact on, on understanding what you've got there. But basically, we mapped these out, and there didn't seem to be too much of a, of a, a, a correlation between uh, the areas where we had more hepatitis versus uh, more liver cancer. Um, so basically, in summary, the spatial cluster analysis showed that consistent cluster west of downtown over the years that we looked at here, and then for the census tracts that overlapped Kelly, the liver cancer rates appeared to be about threefold higher than the rest of the county, whereas the total cancer rates, that's all cancers combined, looked like they were very similar distributions. Some of the strengths of the analysis that we did were really related to the fact that we overcame the major flaw with that analysis that we looked at, which is looking at zip codes. Zip codes are too big to look at. A zip code would include all of Kelly and a whole bunch of other area there. And if you're trying to resolve where patterns are for higher incidence, it's just too gross. Uh, we also had uh, census tracts actually in our area, because of our densely populated city, provided larger numbers there. Also, we used 12 years worth of cancer registry data. Our cancer registry in Texas was as I said, the second newest one in the country. You know, they didn't have their act together. But I've been on their advisory committee for the last 10 years. I chaired the advisory committee for the Texas Cancer Registry for the last four years. And basically, we went from being a pretty reasonable registry up to gold certification. There's a, there's a, a standards committee, the National Association of Can Central Cancer Registries in North America, NACER, that basically certifies each registry. They do evaluation outcome metrics of quality. Look at timeliness of reporting, proportion of cancer incidence cases that are identified by death certificates, and a number of other measures to see about quality. Well, we made the gold certification about five years ago or six years ago now. So it's a very good cancer registry, probably 99% complete reporting. And uh, so we, we know that the data are very reliable, and there's fairly large numbers with a 12-year period of time. So we're not talking about super uh, small cell sizes when we look at the analysis. And then the other thing that's very important to understand is while there was a lot of controversy and the public were very upset about protests and the fact that they were getting killed by these toxic chemicals near Kelly, when we did our analysis, we used an undirected analysis. The cluster spatial assessment was done with no a priori information. We just looked at rates as they occurred. So we weren't trying to bias it and try, trying to look specifically at the Kelly area. We actually did an un, undirected type of analysis that way. There are a whole bunch of limitations when you do these kinds of ecologic studies. First of all, the census data were only available at the time of the analysis, 
for the year 2000. So the census data are important because you use that as the denominator to figure out what your cancer incidence rates are. You got X number of occurrences that occur and are reported in the cancer registry divided by the population size. Well, they only do the census every 10 years. So we're using 2000 data and we're applying that to 1996 all the way up to 2005. So there's clearly a problem and it's more of a problem when you have a population that's growing. And San Antonio is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. So we have this potential problem of not really accounting for the population size appropriately for the years that we looked at everything. That's one thing. And especially, we live in the northwest part of the city. If you look at that, it was very sparse back in the earlier time, and it's grown like crazy over the last 10 years. <clears throat> so we may have been uh, undercounting the, the population there. Also, census, the US Census, at least up until the present time, didn't allow for simultaneous adjustment of both race and, and ethnicity. And as you know, Hispanics are not, Hispanic is not a race, technically speaking, by demographers. Hispanic is an ethnicity. So you can have, you can be a black Hispanic, people from Cuba and from parts of the Caribbean, black Hispanics. You can be a white Hispanic. I'm not sure, the Filipinos don't quite count as Hispanics, they're Asian, but so you can, you certainly see that race and ethnicity are def, definitely different. You can't adjust for both things at the same time with the census data. So we actually did repeat analyses looking at ethnicity adjustment only, and it turns out in San Antonio, that was the important one, because we have 55% Hispanic population in, 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 the, in our county. So we have a Hispanic majority population in Texas. And the African American population is limited to about 2.5% or so. So we were able to look at this, I think, in a fairly accurate way. <clears throat> the, other, the other issue was that ecologic analyses preclude the assessment of exposures at the individual level. And I can't tell you how important this is. The fact that there's exposure in the groundwater in this census tract doesn't have anything to do with what I'm exposed to. I drink bottled water. I, you know, I, I only drink Perrier, for example. Okay, so I, I, I don't necessarily, I can't really associate the aggregate level with what I'm doing as an individual. That's called the ecologic fallacy. So when you see these kinds of studies published, you always have to be careful because they indicate, you may indicate that there's an increased risk and there may be something going on there, but you can't just let it rest at that, saying, yes, we have a cluster here, we must do something about it. You can't implement that as public policy at this level. In addition to that, the other problem with liver cancer, HCC in particular, is the latency of this disease is long. It may be over multiple, multiple decades. It may be 40 or 50 years of exposure to something like chronic alcohol use and, H and hepatitis B and C infection. It may take you 20 or 30 or 40 years to develop a cancer. And we're looking at a very narrow time window here, so we didn't go back, we didn't have cancer registry data going back before 1996. So we're also got to be cautious about making inferences about a disease occurrence which may have been preceded by exposures that happened many decades ago. And that's just a limitation that we, we have to deal with. Lastly, it's a cluster analysis only. It's an ecologic study. It's correlational only. This is a very bi big deal here. I actually worked on a court case in Florida when I was there. There was a child born in Miami with no eyes. It was, it's, it's called anophthalmia. And I, a plaintiff's attorney got in touch with me and said, we want you to help us out. We have this idea here that the, kid, the mother was exposed to Benlate, which is a fungicide that DuPont produced. The mother was exposed to Benlate in her first trimester at a very high dose. I thought, well, this is kind of crazy. But it turned out the mother walked by a, a strawberry field in their neighborhood in Kendall, which is a suburb of Miami. And they were spraying, there was a strawberry field there. They were spraying this, this, uh, this fungicide and it's supposed to be diluted 1 to 10,000 in the machines. The machine broke. It was pure concentrate that was being exposed, that was being laid down there. And they put together a very strong case that this mother got enough exposure. And there was some other data in, in the Britain about anophthalmia being associated with Benlate use. And so I was involved in this court case. And it took three years of discovery to get to the, to, to the actual trial down in Miami. And the defense counsel, and they actually employed three independent defense firms. DuPont had big money, right? They had three different law groups that were working on their defense. They came up with this, this paper that was published about six months earlier. It was an ecologic study in Italy showing benlate use and an anophthalmia and microphthalmia in Italy by each of the, it was an ecologic study like this. And they, they failed to find an association between benlate use in the ecologic study and anophthalmia. 
So the defense counsel got a hold of this article and said, oh, we've got it now, this is going to save us. And they used that as their, their most compelling bit of evidence in the trial. And I came along as the last, a prosec a, a last plaintiff's attorney witness and basically discredited that, saying that an ecologic study that fails to find association is meaningless. It's not informative. And that destroyed their case. They lost the case. I went home from the trial. I was there um, two days before it closed. Then That was like on a Thursday. In Monday's Wall Street Journal, I picked up a law column there. It says, DuPont loses $4 million case. So basically, the plaintiff's attorney won that court case on the basis of the, the kind of discrediting their, their use of an ecologic study. It went to appellate court in Florida, and the appellate court upheld the decision. And that was the end of it. I kind of heard about that through the grapevine, and I didn't think about it again. And about three years later, another attorney called me up and said, we want you to be involved in another case here. We read about you know, the, the, the Castillo versus DuPont case. That was really something. I said, oh well, yeah, I was, so he says, yeah, getting all the way to the Supreme Court, the guy says to me on the phone. I said, what? It went to the US Supreme Court, and they overturned the, 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 the decision. It's very hard to establish causality. And so it went through the local courts, the state appellate court, and all the way up to the US Supreme Court before it got overturned. But anyway, it was all on the basis of this ecologic study there. So enough said about that. What do you do next? So we found a hot spot there. It looks like it's fairly consistent. So the evidence from the ecologic study means we probably need to do something to look at this problem. And we also have the other issue that South Texas has very high incidence rates. And that's not going away. So we need to look at that as well. So the only practical way to sort this out is to actually do a study of individual risk factors at, at the level of the person, not at the whole aggregate like this. And so if you go to Wikipedia, my major source for all knowledge, okay, <laughs> I just pulled this up. The main risk factors for HCC are alcoholism, hepatitis B and C, aflatoxin, which is a toxin produced on, it's, it grows on moldy grains, grains that are stored under moldy conditions like rice, wheat, corn, this sort of thing. If they're stored in, stored in moldy conditions, the, the mold will grow and the mold produces aflatoxin, which is the most potent, I understand, the most potent natural carcinogen. It's an incredibly potent carcinogen and probably accounts for most of the incidence of liver cancer in China and other parts of the developing world where they have they eat contaminated grains. Um, in addition to that, you have some other things. Cirrhosis of the liver, which is probably a precondition to get HCC, and uh, other things which are very weakly associated and, or not associated but are suspected. So that's kind of the, the lineup there. And what we did is we applied to the equivalent of your stem cell fund in, in California. We have the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas. The taxpayers of Texas a couple, about four years ago, five years ago, approved a bond initiative to put $3 billion into cancer research. So that's basically 300, 300 million per year being distributed for cancer research in Texas. So guess what? I was going to take advantage of it. I applied for one of their R01 equivalents, an individual investigator award, and lo and behold, it got funded. So we started our study, a case control study back, uh, we officially got the funding last December. We're, we're moving along now. And the aims of the study are to characterize the occurrence of liver cancer, not just in Bear County, but to look at all of South Texas. That's number one. Number two, to do a pilot case control study to basically establish that we can feasibly do this kind of a study. That is to do a study, where, and I'll show you the design in a second, but we're going to do interviews with individuals as well as collect blood and urine to look at some of the things we're looking at. And then lastly, from this pilot study, to actually be able to establish some effect sizes that we would use to plan out a much larger case control study. So that was what the goals were of the grant. Uh, let me kind of move along here. And this is just the timeline for when we're doing things. And we actually are pretty much on time now. It took us six months to develop the questionnaire, six months to develop at the same time the protocol for getting samples shipped. The samples are being shipped and we're doing all these assays. I'll show you in a second. And we are now under active uh, recruitment now. We've got seven cases accrued. We're going to have a large bolus of controls accrued uh, over the next two months or so. And the study design here is a simple, Simple analytic case control study with 40 cases, 80 frequency match controls. We're collecting pre-treatment blood and urine on cases. And of course, the controls don't have cancer, so we're collecting blood and urine on them. And then we're doing these one-hour in-person administered uh, uh, telephone, not telephone, in-person administered questionnaires where we actually interview people. And you can imagine, in our place, we have to have bilingual folks because the majority of people will be responding in Spanish. But that's not new for us at all in our research that we do. 
<coughs> the laboratory assays that we're doing now are looking at not only hepatitis B and C evidence of infection, which is usually based on antibodies, but we're doing very, very uh, detailed work on looking at viral load and some of the other attributes of hepatitis infection. Uh, and that's being done by quantitative PCR. Uh, we're doing a liver panel function test on everybody in the normal uh, chem panel as well as a hemoglobin A1C. We have also a very high prevalence of type 2 diabetes in San Antonio. And uh, in fact, it's the capital for kids and adolescents. We have the highest prevalence rate of type 2 diabetes in the country. We have kids 13 years of age with body mass indexes of 50. I mean, just unbelievable. So we're, and there's been a correlation between diabetes risk and HCC risk, and we're looking at that as well. And just to show you the chronology of how people have attacked the issue of the etiology of HCC, in the 60s, people kind of looked at liver cirrhosis as being a precursor state that was always there. We looked at chronic infection with hep B in the 70s and the 80s. It was hepatitis C virus. And these viruses, by the way, are very, one's an RNA virus, the other one's a DNA virus. There's, there's nothing similar about them except the fact they, they hit the liver and they cause liver inflammation. Um, in addition to that, in the 90s, people have looked at other exposures like tobacco smoking and alcohol use directly. Um, and then um, in, the, in, in, the, in the teens, basically, uh, we have been looking at uh, exposure to mycotoxins. Now, again, those are, that includes aflatoxin, but we think these are major, major risk factors for disease. So we're looking at that very carefully. And uh, we have some other things we're looking at. So with aflatoxins in particular, we're looking at some of the, or mycotoxins, we're looking at some of the metabolites that are persistent in blood and urine. And it includes the, um, the um, alpha, uh, aflatoxin uh, uh, B1, metabolite, and there's a DNA adduct in particular that has a persistence of about two months. So we're looking at these measures, as well as a, there's a, a marker for exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And uh, anyway, um, and we're doing the normal stuff you have to do in an epidemiology study, look at sociodemographic factors, lifestyle factors, obesity and so on, comorbidities, as well as oral contraceptive use and exposure to other exogenous hormones, which may have a role here, we don't know. Let me move on. So basically, the study opened to accrual uh, just last November, believe it or not. It takes about a year to get a study up and running, get IRB approval, pilot test questionnaires multiple times. These studies take a long time. It's a three-year funding period. Uh, we've had seven cases uh, registered as of about two weeks ago. I'm not sure if we got more on, on board. We're doing control selection from two sources. One is we're doing a random population assessment using marketing data of households in Bear County as well as participants on another uh, intervention trial I'll talk about, talk about in a second. And uh, those are people that are not treated at all, normal, healthy, quote unquote, healthy volunteers from the, the community. Uh, now, I want to move on. Um, so while this was all brewing up and my colleagues were very excited about this aflatoxin hypothesis, so in Texas, we have a population that has almost identical seroprevalence rates of hep B and C as the rest of the country. Yet we have two and a half times higher risk of HCC. So that's kind of puzzling there. What are the other factors that contribute to HCC risk? Well, we know alcoholism does. Chronic alcohol exposure, cirrhosis of the liver. Well, guess what? Hispanics actually have lower alcoholism rates than non-Hispanics do. So that doesn't explain the difference. And we're trying to put our heads together, and there's a lot of thought that it may be exposure to aflatoxin. Now, where would people get exposed to aflatoxin? Well, it turns out that um, People in my community basically grow their own corn to make their own corn tortillas. And what they do is they harvest corn. In fact, these little houses on the west side of San Antonio have a long, they're very long vertical lots with a very narrow house on each lot. They grow in a whole row of corn along the side of their, their plots. And in August, they harvest this corn. I mean, we're not talking about their farm, we're talking about city dwellers. They harvest the corn, they dry it out, quote unquote dry it out, shuck it from the ears, and they store it this dried corn in these hefty trash can ba bags outside, and they seal the trash can bags up. Well, guess what? It's not really dry corn. It's, it's drier corn, but there's still moisture in there. So we actually think there may be, and there's also people bringing in masa from Mexico from their relatives that come up. So we think that a source of aflatoxin exposure that may be unusual in our population may be consumption of contaminated grains, you know, homegrown type things like this. So we're looking at that very carefully. In addition to that, one of my colleagues at Texas A&M has done some work and I uh, worked with another person at MD Anderson to develop a clay intervention. So over in Ghana now, he's got a study that's going on with kids. So kids in Ghana that are getting this nutritional supplement made of peanut butter, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, 
the peanuts that are used, a, a couple of the companies wanted to produce the peanuts in the, in the United States and ship them over there. The government says, no, there has to be locally grown peanuts. We think there's a lot of aflatoxin exposure to children over in Africa. And so we, they developed an intervention. It's a, it's a clay tablet that's taken. This clay is a manufactured clay that has a very high affinity for mycotoxins. And the idea is you take the pill with your meal, and if there's any aflatoxin in the diet, in the, in the food contents there, it'll bind to this clay substrate and basically stays bound to it and just gets passed out the body without being absorbed. So this, this drug, ACCS 100, it's an FDA investigational thing, right? It's a, it's a food supplement, not a drug per, per se, but the FDA had to approve this. We have an IND now to do a randomized, and we got an R01 funded to do a randomized controlled clinical trial that we started um, about the same time as a case control study. And basically uh, what this is, is a study to try, this is what the uh, molecule looks like, the clay tablet. It provides a very strong binding site, as I said, for mycotoxins. The primary objective is to establish the safety and effectiveness of this agent, this clay, we call it the clay study, it's got a clay agent, to, to establish that um, in people in our county that are exposed to aflatoxin. So what we're doing in the study is we're screening people off the street, if you will, to see if they have aflatoxin levels. And this was done once before. My colleague at AM came down about five years ago and did a survey of households near Kelly Air Force Base. It turned out that 19% of the, of the people that they surveyed had detectable levels of aflatoxin. The percent should be 0% in this country. People that buy their food sources from commercial things like Archer Daniels, if you go to the supermarket, the grains that we use to make bread and everything else, they're sold commercially, they're free of aflatoxin. There's very tight regulation. There should be nobody exposed to aflatoxin. 19% of the people were found to be exposed in that kind of a semi-random survey that was out of three zip codes. Well, we started our study right now. We have 93 people accrued in the last four months in the study. We're finding 46% of them have detectable levels of aflatoxin. That's an eligibility criterion for going on to the randomized portion of the study. So we're finding a lot more exposure than we expected, which is good for us because our trial will be much less expensive to do. We were going to plan to screen 1,500 people and do the sophisticated assays on that number of people just to get like about 20% of them we thought that would be eligible for the randomized intervention. We're finding it's almost half the population that we're screening now that are going on and doing our randomized portion of the study. <clears throat> Let me kind of move forward. So our cruel target for the study is actually a total of 69 subjects per arm. It's a low dose, high dose, and placebo uh, for exposure here. And we're going to get a total of 207 subjects that will be eligible, that will complete the, uh, the uh, randomized portion of the study. So our progress is pretty good, and uh, we're moving forward with that right now. So let me move on. And basically, what I want to just, just show you here is that <clears throat> this is an example of kind of how you put together a, um, a study here. Well, you start with very simple descriptive uh, data, which we got from our geospatial cluster analysis, right? That's just descriptive data. We're not doing anything except trying to measure things with available data sources there. You may get a clue that there's something going on. That provided a rationale for doing our case control study, which is a, it's a descriptive study, but it's actually an analytic study because we have hypotheses that we're testing. So we're doing the case control study now, and while we jumped the gun a little bit, we weren't able to show that aflatoxin was the culprit We've started doing our intervention trial right now. It is known that aflatoxin is a carcin carcinogenic agent. The most common organ it affects is the liver. As I said, in the developing world, it's probably the primary source of liver cancer. And so we're starting, we started an intervention trial right now to lower levels of aflatoxin over a 12-week period of time and look at this in a very sensitive way. So our future plans for this research really include doing a larger study once we get the, hopefully we'll get results that are interesting and that'll be rationale for going ahead and doing a much larger case control study that we'll probably do throughout all of South Texas. There's, I think, 34 counties in South Texas. Um, and we'll be able to look with a little bit more resolution at some of the things that we've already talked about. Uh, and then also we're setting up a biorepository right now of tumor material as well as blood, uh, blood for DNA and somatic tissue. Uh, we're interested in looking at some of the pathogenic uh, mechanisms for development of HCC, and so we've got our biorepository set up right now. We can set the subjects on our studies to actually provide uh, permission for us to keep the material and then to contact them for some future research. And we're getting right now 
100% approvals on that portion of our consent form, which is, which is very uh, satisfying. We want to look at some of the uh, genetic markers, and in particular the epigenetic markers, as well as some of the protein markers that may give us a better clue about what's going on in terms of the pathogenesis of the disease. So I just want to acknowledge uh, a couple of my colleagues. Corey Sparks is one of my demographer colleagues over at UT San Antonio, one of our sister, it's our sister campus in town. He's a terrific demographer. He actually uh, was Penn State graduate, quantitative demographer. He's really a statistician. He's a, a whiz at R, and he basically has integrated R into um, ArcGIS, where we do some really nice things together. And then Dr. Uh, Fernando Guerra was our county health director for 20 years. He retired last year. Uh, Dr. Guerra was actually, he's a, a member of the Institute of Medicine. I think he's the only county health director that was an IOM member. Brilliant guy, a pediatrician. And then uh, Kyle Cunningham worked for, for Dr. Guerra. And then Eric Miller was my contact, epidemiology contact and, and colleague up at the, uh, in Austin at the Texas Cancer Registry. I want to acknowledge their, their help in supporting this. And I have a fairly large team now working on these two funded grants. And uh, it's, it's quite satisfying. I have to tell you, I'm, as a department chair, um, I don't get a lot of time to get my hands dirty. I'm trying to help everybody else in my department get their stuff done. And I wouldn't have been doing this work had my other colleague not quit on me. So you never know how you're going to end up getting funded and what you're going to do uh, down the line. Uh, I just wanted to make one more comment, too, that, that uh, how did I end up going into epidemiology? You've got to ask that question. Because when I started at Irvine as an undergraduate, I didn't know what epidemiology was. Um, I was is Science Lecture Hall still here? Okay, okay, that's where I spent most of my time. And we were, uh, I don't know if they still do this, but we had a Nobel Prize winner that came down every year as a visiting professor. And I was here the year that Linus Pauling came down. Linus Pauling didn't win one Nobel Prize. He won two of them. He won the prize for chemistry, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize. I think he's, I don't know if there's anyone else has won two Nobel Prizes, but uh, he did a lot of, he was very, um, uh, very active in the anti-war movement and anti-bomb movement in the 50s. Um, in any event, Linus Pauling gave four lectures in that quarter that I was here. Three of the, the first three lectures were on the history of biochemistry. He was at Caltech, Cornfield, all these other people that were famous. You know, all these people that I, I heard about, other Nobel laureates. He talked about uh, developing the, the idea of a helix, helical structure for DNA. He didn't know it was a double helix. And the three lectures were brilliant. The fourth lecture he gave was on vitamin C and the health benefits of vitamin C. And he presented all this data on vitamin C about how it cures cancer and everything else. And I looked at the data and I didn't know any better. I think I was a junior at the time. And I, I couldn't make sense of it. It didn't make sense to me. And I remember talking to my biology professor. Uh, Wendell Stanley Jr. was my molecular biology professor. I went in and talked to him the next day. I said, how could I figure out what was going on when he presented all this stuff on vitamin C? I don't understand it. What would I need to learn in order to understand it? He says, well, that would be epidemiology or biostatistics. And literally, that, that's where I got the idea of applying to the, uh, the master's in public health program at UCLA to do an epidemiology degree. So I was sitting over there in the science lecture hall. That's how I ended up in my career path. I just thought you guys wanted to know that. The data I presented today, you won't be able to shoot too many holes in it. But you know, always question what you see. And uh, you'll learn, and somebody as brilliant as Lance Pauling was totally wrong about vitamin C. The rest of his, uh, the later part of his life, he was talking about taking three grams a day, and it, it really was quackery, and it wasn't based on solid evidence. So, but he's a brilliant man anyway, and I still respected him. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, the IRB issues on the first, uh, the, the, uh, the spatial analysis we did, well, actually it turns out that my institution didn't need to do the IRB approval, but the state cancer registry actually has an IRB. So in order to be able to do the analysis I did, I needed to get a hold of cancer registry data that was geocoded to the household and had personal health identifiers on them. So I had to go through an IRB process up in, in Austin that added about three months to the process there because I wanted to make sure my use of the data was not going to essentially reveal some confidential information and so on and so forth. The other studies, though, the case control study, that went through our conventional IRB. And it's interesting, we opened the study up you know, a couple months ago, and we've already now had three amendments. Because as you're doing the study, you find out that, well, we make, have to make an adjustment here. We found another venue to recruit cases from, and so we have to go back in. We've done now three amendments over the last three months, and it's kind of a pain to do that. But you know, that's, that's what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. This is just a comment because you asked a question about Nobel Prize winners, but it turns out Madame Curie won two. Oh, in okay. Science That's history, right. And she won one by herself and one with her husband. Yeah. Her daughter also won one. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. So wow. Uh, Exciting. But uh, not the combo of science and the Peace Prize. Okay, <laughs> I can say that's unique. But thank you for the, the, the clarification. Yeah, I, I have to say it was really. I heard uh, when I was here, Melvin Calvin came down. He's the one who did the dark cycle photosynthesis. Conrad, uh, Conrad, oh Hans Conrad, who did the cholesterol biosynthesis. You know about? I mean, these. I don't. Know, are they still doing that lecture series here? Because it was. It was just wonderful to, to be able to, as an undergraduate, to be exposed to these Nobel laureates. And at my place in San Antonio, we've invited a Nobel laureate once every year. And it's interesting now, they don't look as old as they did when I was an undergraduate. Uh, but one, the, 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 uh, but it, it's been interesting. The, the guy at UCLA, uh, Ignacio, I think, who won the Nobel Prize for the nitrogen oxide mechanism, that the basis for Viagra, he came in. And actually, his presentation was interesting because he spent half of it talking about the process of actually getting awarded the Nobel Prize and what he went through, and it was like from a personal standpoint, he was over at a meeting in Nice in Europe, and, he, and they got a call from the, the committee, and he had no idea he was gonna be uh, nominated or whatever, and, um, and then he, he talked, and he had photographs of him going and getting the award, and, but he talked about it from a personal standpoint, and I thought that was really very cool. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have it, but we have to bring it back, but meanwhile, we are satisfied with it. <laughs> oh, good. So my question, we have this similar uh, Oh, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was declared a super fund site before any kind of indication of exposure. Yes, yeah. And I was curious why this uh, Texas Air Force Base was not declared. Yeah, I think it had to do with, it's kind of, quite, so I worked, when I was in Florida, we had one of the super fun basic science research projects, that, and I, in fact, I'm going in with A&M right now on another super fun uh, research, I call them super fun research projects. Um, to become a designated super fun site, there has to be, it's actually, most of the sites that were done were, there was gross contamination. I mean, we're talking about industrial accidents, spills, things like this. And I think the threshold by which you get declared a Superfund site is, is a lot higher than the levels that you saw here that I showed you on the plume maps are one part per billion and they were kind of diffuse and so on. So I, I think the Superfund sites tend to be designated at an area where they're going to do re remediation and here there wouldn't be anything to remediate at all. But there, you know, the NIEHS and the EPA went in together to create the Superfund uh, project uh, things and I worked, I worked on that grant about 15 years ago in Florida and They've had, they had 10 years of grant funding, and A&M had one a long time ago. I'm actually uh, now going in with A&M on a one, we're gonna use San Antonio, and we're looking at aflatoxin exposure as one of the major sites for what we're gonna do in this project. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. My question is about the plate package that you're about. Yes. Um, can you discuss the cost effectiveness? I mean, is it expensive? How often will people have this? Yes. Yes. Um, well, it's actually an investigational agent right now. My colleague, Bob Carpenter, has a company that he did develop this. The cost will be relatively low. It's, this is a, it's a manufactured clay, but it's, uh, it didn't have to go through, you know, sort of the normal, it's not a drug. So the FDA, would, uh, drug testing is much more expensive. Um, so the actual real use of this, uh, it's being done in Africa right now, and it's, we're talking about a dollar a day type of, type of a level there. Uh, and the other question you had was, I'm sorry, it was about, there was a cost of effectiveness, and then... Yes, so they take one tablet, one capsule per meal. So it's eight, with each meal right now. Now we don't know whether, what we're looking at now are quantitative drops in aflatoxin levels. So they have to have minimum detectable level in their blood or urine, and then we're looking at as a quantitative outcome metric here to see what's going on. Um, yeah, but that's a good question. Yes? Yeah. Well, you know, this is actually one of those surrogate endpoints, and I, you know, so the whole area of chemo prevention, you know, you, you, you're involved in this. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. You've got to use these proxy measures because you can't wait 20, 30 years for somebody to develop their cancer. And for HCC in particular, we're talking about this is a latency that's way beyond a lot of other cancers. Um, but the nice thing here is that there's very strong data showing aflatoxin levels and cancer risk, and it's kind of something we don't have to do. But the next step is the African study is going on right now with kids. Uh, the CDC approached my colleague Tim Phillips at A&M and they want him to go into Kenya to do another trial, and I'm gonna be involved in that study. 
And then we're, gonna, we're doing the, the adult study right now in San Antonio. And what we plan to do is to do a pediatric study if we get funded on the Superfund uh, project that we put in. Um, I think we have to get that kind of data first to show that there's a true quantitative decrease here. Because, you know, let me tell you, we had three or four patients, at, three or four subjects out of the last 10 that didn't come in for their, their, second, uh, their second visit, didn't get the second set of meds. You know, the attrition rate is very high. It's high in volunteers, especially when you have to do something three times a day with the, the tablets. They get blood tested uh, at six weeks and at 12 weeks and, of course, at baseline. And that doesn't seem to bother them. And we actually pay out incentives for the, the they get gift cards from our big HEB grocery chain for each time they come in and complete that. Um, but still, we, we're getting a number of dropouts, which we, we built into our sample size uh, planning, the attrition rate. But I think the next steps are really to get more clinical data to show that there's a quantitative drop. And then beyond that, that may be a tough stretch. And I certainly think going into areas where you have endemic liver cancer would be where you'd focus your efforts. And as I said, over in, in Ghana, that we're, they have very high liver cancer rates there. This will be a very good test to see whether there's uh, some impact. But we're not setting up a large cohort to be able to follow these people 20, 30 years out. But I think showing that you've, you've arrested the exposure to aflatoxin unlike some other chemopreventive uh, surrogate endpoints, is a little bit better. It's a little bit more solid. But it's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you then assess exposure 40 years prior to their diagnosis or for therapy? Good question. And that is the fundamental limitation of case control studies. A case control study starts with a, hopefully, preferably, a newly diagnosed case, an incident case, and controls. You don't know what happened to exposures prior to the time that they come onto your study. And they've already got the disease, the cases do. So you try to use proxy measures. Now, we're using a measure of aflatoxin exposure that has a two-month half-life. That doesn't tell me what they did 10 years ago. So you're always limited in doing this. Um, I was involved. I did the large national case control study looking at risk factors for HIV-related malignancies in kids. I was funded. That was my first R01 I got. And we published this in JAMA. I have a first author paper in JAMA about uh, seven or eight years ago. But in that instance, we, we actually had compelling data using a case control methodology because we, we didn't have a cohort to go back to look at to see what was going on. But we looked at viral exposure, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, CMV, HIV, uh, HHV6, I believe. Uh, and we basically correlated viral load at the time that they were registered under my study, which is before they got cancer treatment, in cases of controls, and we showed an 11-fold increased risk for, for kids that had high viral loads of EBV. Okay, now, the question is, well, what does that mean? I mean, did they have EBV titers that went back a year, two years before, five years before? You can never work out the sequence of what's going on in terms of the pathogenesis using a case control design. So it's really a first step. The problem is the alternative design, which is to use a cohort study, requires the study of a large number of people over a long period of time. With childhood cancer, it can't be done because these are so infrequently occurring cancers. There's a total of 15,000 cases a year in the United States of all childhood cancers combined. There's 190,000 breast cancer cases every year. You couldn't possibly do a cohort design for a childhood cancer study. In addition to that, the National Children's Study, which is now being closed down, <coughs> the original planning for that was to accrue 100,000 children from the third trimester of, of pregnancy all the way through to 21 years of age. Okay, even with that study that was planned out, and Dr. Guerra, by the way, was on the planning committee for that, our county health director, we expected to get no valid data for cancer outcomes because there weren't enough folks in that cohort to actually have reliable estimates of any kind of cancer incidence effects at all. So it was focused on asthma, more common childhood illnesses rather than cancer. So unfortunately, us people that study rare diseases are stuck with a case control methodology, which doesn't let you go back Historically, now, if you're lucky enough to work in Kaiser, you can do a nested case control study where you go back and you have blood samples that may have been collected 20 years earlier, right? That weren't, they were collected for routine purposes. And uh, you come back now 20 years down in the future, you come along and you say, I want to go back and look at those samples. The problem there is going to be reliability of how the stuff was stored, whether you had permission to actually do the analyses you want to do, and whether it's there or not. And it may not be there. So we, we try to do these nested case control studies where they're done nested within a cohort, so you have some historical data, but those are very few and far between, unfortunately. But you're collecting residential history, at least? We are collecting that, yes. And I've done this with electromagnetic field. Uh, i published stuff in EMF exposure and child leukemia. Even getting that, you know, and kids, families move around. We tried looking at mobility as one of the other covariates there, and 
You know, it's not real informative. You really like to have people in a cohort. My, my uh, partner in crime, Joel Mahalik, is my vice chair, head of our biostat division. Joel was the PI for the Air Force's Agent Orange study for 21 years. They followed these veterans 25 years. It was called the Ranch Hand Study, because that was the name of the unit of the Air Force that sprayed defoliant over in Vietnam. And they had control folks, and they had people that flew in the helicopters, and they followed them for 25 years with multiphasic testing every couple of years. Scripps down in San Diego did all the uh, physical exam and lab work. It's a huge study. It was funded directly by Congress. He, did a re he delivered his report to Congress and the Institute of Medicine. And even at that, you, know, you look at the outcomes, and they were able to look at some. They didn't find anything that was super definitive in terms of an of a exposure correlation with a, with a health outcome. Just some weaker associations. And that's a very expensive study that was done with a huge amount of follow-up time. So when you're dealing with childhood cancer or rare diseases, you're, we're, we're just kind of stuck, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Continue this discussion. Uh, everyone is invited at the lobby of Anteater Instruction and Research Building. So oh, great. Please, uh, join us again. So thank you very much. Thank you.